so my name is Michael Keeling, and I am here to talk to you guys today about uh, architecture-centric design thinking. Um, so design as a way of thinking isn't actually a new idea. Uh, it's been around for really quite a while. Uh, first introduced by, um, well, first credited, I guess, to, to Herbert Simon uh, in 1969. Um, it wasn't really until recently, though, that companies like uh, IDEO have made uh, design, taken design and made it as a um, kind of a business differentiator. Okay, and they did something that was, in retrospect, extremely intuitive, uh, and yet nobody was doing it. Right? They put the user first. Okay, so IDEO uh, and companies like them would uh, empathize you know, very deeply with the user, try to understand the actual problem that this person has, uh, and then they would work to solve that problem rather than just guessing about what might be a good, good idea. Um, this was a really good approach, but it had an unintended side effect. Uh, and that was that design kind of shifted to focusing almost exclusively on user interface. Okay, so there's a lot more to design in a software system than just the user interface, right? It's important, but there's a lot more to it, right? Many different perspectives on design that you might have. Uh, so you know, user interface, of course, is one. We oftentimes talk about like information architecture, designing databases, um, you know, the product vision, the overall kind of product uh, design. Uh, detailed design in the code is, is you know, essential as well. For us in this conference, we're talking about software architecture and software architecture design. Uh, and kind of in my experience and in my opinion, software architecture is the thing that kind of holds all these other perspectives together, right? So it's kind of our job to take the different perspectives of design and mend it together into one kind of unified software system in some way. Right, so yeah, I see software architecture as the foundation upon which everything is built. Uh, and, and it kind of is. Um, kind of thinking about this and reflecting on it, this is what led me to, to start to try and understand how design thinking and de design thinking ideas might work within the context of software architecture. All right, so what is design thinking? Uh, here's the, uh, I don't know, mediocre definition from Wikipedia. Uh, design thinking stands for the design specific cognitive activities that all designers apply in the process of designing. Right, it's just design, 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 design. Right, um, awesome. So uh, it might help to define what design is. Uh, I don't have a great definition for that today, but I do have this kind of idea from Fred Brooks here. Um, when we're talking about design, we're actually talking potentially about four different things. Uh, the noun, so the thing that we designed, um, you know, an artifact, something like that. Uh, design is also the verb, you know, to design something, so the act of designing. Um, there's also this idea of like a sensibility, you know, we talk about, or, or an aesthetic, you know, we talk about great design or that thing is so well designed, right? Uh, and then of course, you know, the method or the act of doing all of these things as well. Nice and confusing, but really for me, it, it really comes down to two ideas, right? So design thinking is, well, a way of thinking about design, uh, and it's also a collection of, of design focused methods. All right, so let's break this down and, and kind of dive uh, into a little more detail on these. So. I like to think of design, uh, let's see here, the thinking part of design as a set of modes that uh, can really be applied in any order, where a mode is a, a mindset, right? So you're getting into some kind of specific mindset, right? Reflecting, this a lot on, a lot, uh, reflecting on this uh, in the context of software architecture and trying to align with some of the other uh, design thinking frameworks that are out there, of which there are many, um, I've kind of settled on these four modes, okay? Explore, understand, evaluate, make. All right, so in the understand mode, what we're doing is trying to actively seek information from stakeholders and then frame or, or reframe the problem. So this is all about defining the problem and trying to characterize it in some way, uh, hopefully so that it, it aligns with a, perhaps a pattern or, or, or a um, problem from the past, but not necessarily. All right, in the explore mode, you know, we're using generative thinking to identify design concepts and engineering approaches, okay? So uh, exploration is really all about casting a wide net, trying to understand in the context of a solution, like what might work, right? So what are some different ideas to do that? Um, specifically though, you know, looking for concepts, but I'm also interested in engineering approaches. How can we actually build the thing that we are uh, trying to, to work on? Right, in the make mode, uh, we're gonna realize concepts by creating them in the real world as a model, prototype, program, or other artifact. So we gotta create something, right? You might write code, uh, you might draw a diagram, uh, creating something that actually exists in the real world, okay? And then finally, with evaluate, we're de determining the fitness of design decisions and deciding whether to revisit other modes, right? So we take a hard look at what we've got and we say, uh, you know, does this work? Do we like it? What's wrong with it? 
what else do we need to know? And then that kind of dictates where we go next. You know, do we shift into a different mindset uh, or do we move on to some other activity? All right, so four, uh, four design modes uh, that, that seem to work pretty well with, with software architecture um, kind of thinking. All right, so design, uh, design thinking in general also has a collection of design-focused methods, right? Uh, when I'm talking about a method, uh, I'm really talking about some activity that embraces a specific mode and active, you know, promotes some kind of active learning, okay? So you have a mindset, and now you want to get some kind of knowledge uh, from your stakeholders or your team or the, or the system in general, okay? Uh, Here's a bunch of architecture-focused design methods, uh, some of which are probably familiar to you uh, from, for example, the SEI literature. Uh, some of these I have liberally uh, taken from other design disciplines, such as user experience design, and uh, either tune them for architecture or they just work as is. Uh, some of these are totally homegrown, made-up stuff that seems to work pretty well with our customers. Um, uh, I don't have time to go into all of these, but I'm going to try and dive into to three examples today. Uh, and the first one is question, comment, concern. All right, this is a um, method in the evaluate mode. All right, so we're trying to um, well, evaluate things. Uh, this is kind of what it looks like. Okay, so you've got some view of your architecture system, uh, some, some view of your architecture, uh, and you have a group of people uh, usually working collaboratively to identify questions, comments, and concerns within that particular view, right, where you might use uh, different color sticky notes to indicate a question, a comment, or concern. Um, yeah, so this is a really great visualization technique. It's also a really great way for quickly sharing knowledge. Um, we, we've used this uh, in small groups very, very effectively uh, as a, kind of an evaluation or, or a checkpoint. All right, and here, here's another example, uh, stakeholder maps. Uh, this is actually an, a, an idea from Ari, who I'm sure got it from someone else. Uh, she'll be giving a talk uh, later this afternoon, uh, so you guys should check that out. Um, this is a, a method from the understand, uh, understand mode. Uh, this is, here's some examples for what it might look like. Um, so these, uh, so with a stakeholder map, you're looking to basically brainstorm about various stakeholders in your system and understand how they might be interrelated to one another. Okay, so you're drawing simple icons uh, to represent your uh, stakeholders or groups of people, uh, lines to show how they're connected to one another, speech bubbles to show what they're thinking or feeling, things like that. What's really great about this is you know, it helps to keep the focus on the user, on the people in your system, uh, and also helps you to kind of branch out a little bit further beyond just the, you know, uh, typical stakeholders that you might normally, uh, normally think about, okay? Next steps after a, a, you know, activity like this would be maybe we should talk to some of these guys to understand what their concerns are, right? You might choose a subset of these guys for a quality attributes workshop, for example. All right, uh, one more example here. So the uh, system properties web or the quality attributes web uh, is a, uh, a method in the understand mode. Uh, this is kind of what it looks like. So it's a visualization of raw quality attributes, uh, while raw quality attribute scenarios uh, that are, you know, sometimes you might have a taxonomy, which you see here, um, sometimes not. Uh, and this is really just a, uh, you know, quick kind of informal way to brainstorm quality attributes, right? Kind of simple, but uh, that's what makes it so awesome, right? Um, one of the really cool things about this is you get a, um, a visualization of how the visualization of the characteristics of your system. So you could run this exact same taxonomy with a completely separate uh, system and you will have a different clustering. You can see right away how that uh, system differs from uh, the, the previous one. All right, so that's the, the theory bits. Uh, let's talk a little about, about how you can actually do this stuff in practice. Okay. All right, so we've talked about you know, mindsets or modes, right? We've talked about methods, but really the big question is, okay, that's great, so how am I supposed to figure out what to actually do next, right? This is tricky because you know, these modes can really be executed in any order. And in fact, in, in some cases, in many cases, the intuitive path or the thing that you think you should be doing may not actually be the one that makes the most sense, okay? It could be the un unintuitive path that, that yields kind of the more interesting results. Um, one way to go about doing this is to put on a workshop, okay? And when I'm talking about a workshop, I'm saying let's pick, you know, some set of methods and um, execute those so that I get, you know, something useful, something valuable that, that's good for me. I have a, a, an objective that I want um, to learn, uh, and so I'm going to piece together some methods in a specific way, okay? 
Uh, here, here's an example just picking on the quality attributes workshop. All right, so if we were to take quality attributes workshop and then align that with the uh, design thinking framework that we're kind of tooling with here, uh, here's how it might go. Uh, so Q, the introduction, that's just an intro, really nothing going on there, right? That's just laying the, the foundation for the workshop. Uh, we actually start this in the make mode, okay? So you go about and you create presentations that summarize your, your current knowledge in some way. All right, uh, moving on to understanding. So talking about uh, business um, architectural drivers and uh, going into uh, scenario brainstorming. So working directly with stakeholders to understand what their needs are, all right? From there, we kind of uh, transition into an evaluate mode. So you take the brainstorms that you've got, uh, brainstorm scenarios that you have, consolidate, consolidate those together, do you know, dot voting usually to, to bring it down to a uh, manageable list. Uh, and then finally, kind of to round out the workshop, you would usually go through uh, refinement, which is really oscillating very quickly between uh, make and understanding. So you're trying to make scenarios, and then you're asking uh, clarifying questions as you go to understand really what the lay of the land is. Okay. So, yeah, kind of not intuitive, right? We started with make in this case. Uh, and then the overall flavor of this workshop was around uh, trying to understand the stakeholders' real needs. Okay, so that was one specific example. Uh, here's a generalization that seems to work pretty well uh, uh, in my experience and with the, uh, the teams and the customers that I've been working with. All right, so very kind of high-level structure of a workshop here. Um, yeah, so I should mention this. So when, when we're talking about workshops, there's kind of three Fs, right? And I'm cheating a little bit on that second F. But uh, three Fs to a good workshop, okay? Um, workshops, they need to be fast, okay? You don't want to waste people's time, okay? You need to get in, you got to get it done, learn what you need to learn, okay? They need to be effective, right? Well, yeah, learn what you need to learn, in a, hopefully in a fast way. Um, so very focused on what you're doing. And then finally, you know, the third F here, I think is probably the most important thing. You, you actually have to have your workshop be fun, okay? And the reason for this is, you know, you get better creativity and better engagement when it's not just the doldrum, uh, boring kind of, uh, you know, meeting. Um, so all things equal, you know, if all uh, learning and effectiveness and everything are equal, pick the thing that's the most fun, right? And that's gonna yield uh, much better results. All right, so first kind of step in, in setting up a workshop is just to, to set the stage. And when you're running this, this thing, it usually takes about 15 minutes or so to kind of get everybody on the same page and set expectations. All right, really what this is all about is setting ground rules, okay? You want people to be kind of ready and prepared to um, behave in the way that you want them to behave, okay? Um, part of this is by you preparing ahead of time. So have a good agenda, all right? Uh, there shouldn't be any surprises on, you know, when you're going into this meeting uh, for what's going on, right? Uh, you definitely want to have the right people in the room. Uh, and depending upon, you know, how long you're looking at going, make sure that you're planning ahead and thinking things through, you know, or do you have enough breaks? Uh, are, are people going to be able to um, uh, come and go? Things like that, right? Um, really what this is about is being prepared, you know, you as a facilitator, right? Being prepared. Uh, Actual ground rules themselves. So uh, in addition to having a solid agenda, I oftentimes share you know, just general ground rules for the workshop itself. And if you've done any of the workshops at Saturn or other places, you may have seen a slide similar to this. Um, really, again, this is all about behavior. So reminding people, we're talking about design. It's not about you know, right or wrong. It's about you know, better or worse or exploring something. Um, oftentimes, we want to uh, constrain the activities by time, okay? Because given infinite time, we'll just take forever. Uh, that's not very useful, uh, and sometimes, uh, well, oftentimes, uh, constraints can uh, yield uh, more creativity. Um, yeah, and again, just kind of reiterating, like, yeah, have fun, right? This is a collaborative session, you know, you want to try and have some fun. All right, so setting the stage, about 15 minutes or so. Uh, after that, uh, I like to go into uh, an activity called a stoke, okay? And what this is really about, uh, quick activity, right? that is designed to initiate some kind of active learning and encourage participation, okay? So if I had time today, I would do a stoke right now, okay? But I don't have the time uh, because I only have 20 minutes here. But the whole purpose is to get you guys out of the kind of passive me talking to you mode, uh, a, you know, way of kind of learning and get you to become an active participant in what's happening, all right? Um, I like to think of it as kind of a warm up. Right? We want to warm up your brains, warm up your, your thinking, get you prepared for the, the activities that are actually going to be happening. 
right? And there's a lot of different examples that you can find on the, on the, on the web about this stuff. Um, here's a few that um, are, are fairly interesting. Um, probably the most simple one is to just go around the room and have people say a few words. You know, what do you hope to get out of today's uh, workshop, right? Super simple, right? But extremely important to having an effective, uh, an effective uh, meeting, right? And the reason, it basically you're proving that everybody has a voice and everybody has some kind of an opinion, okay? So even the quietest person in the room uh, is, is going to now feel empowered to participate, which means you're gonna end up with a better result in the end. Okay, so stokes are pretty quick. Uh, and very, very important. Um, after that, you know, you run into the actual design method. So this is the meat of your, of your workshop, the thing that you actually want to, um, the thing you actually want to have some kind of uh, learning in. And this is gonna vary, you know, maybe from 30 minutes to an hour to multiple days, depending on what you uh, need to achieve, okay? And that's really what this is all about. What do you wanna learn, okay? That's gonna be the main driver behind what, uh, what methods you choose to, to do, okay? You can lean on this framework, again, for kind of helping you decide which methods to choose, not just for the activities themselves, but also for the, uh, the overall purpose of the, of the meeting or the workshop that you're having. Okay, so that's one reason why this framework is, is so important, right? Who can participate? Sometimes, uh, you know, you have to change plans based on who is available uh, in the room, okay? So do you have the right people in the room? Uh, and then also another factor is time. You know, how much time do you have? So some of these activities can run longer, some of them shorter, uh, and these are all factors that you need to keep in mind uh, when trying to uh, plan, out, uh, plan out some kind of a design workshop. All right, when introducing a method, five easy steps, okay? Uh, so you share the objective, why are you doing this thing? Uh, you describe the thing step by step. You show a concrete example of what the outcome is supposed to look like. Describe it again, and then you go, hopefully with a time limit. Okay, so fairly straightforward. Um, showing exa an example could probably be one of the more important things. Uh, it helps people to uh, visualize in their minds what they themselves might be producing. Okay, so very uh, kind of critical idea. All right, final bit here. So uh, you can't just have things end. You really need to have a solid, solid kind of closing uh, to any kind of workshop that you run. Uh, and really what this is all about is making sure that you give people a chance to reflect on the activities that you've done today, maybe on the outcomes themselves, uh, sharing any kind of insights or ahas, uh, and perhaps uh, even more importantly, action items, right? So what is gonna be the follow-up, right, for this, uh, for this activity, you know, making sure that we actually get a good business outcome from this. All right, so there's some ideas for applying, so I'm gonna turn the tables on you guys now, okay, and, um, you know, give you the charge for um, taking these things back to your companies, okay? Uh, before I do that, so some, part, some parting advice here. So there is a lot more to architecture and design than workshops, sticky notes, and pretty pictures. Okay, so um, a lot of these things that I've been talking about may look like that, but uh, design is really hard, and you have to think a lot, okay? You have to get your hands dirty, right? Especially with architecture, you have to write code, okay? So it's, um, you know, writing experiments, trying things out. Uh, this is not just a, you know, write in, you know, doodle on the whiteboard kind of a thing all the time, right? Um, so to review, you know, I like to think of design thinking as just a way of thinking about design and a collection of design methods, okay? Uh, in the case of architecture, we want to focus on architecture-focused kinds of methods, right? Four different design modes, explore, understand, evaluate, make, uh, give you a way to kind of think. Uh, a large collection of different methods that uh, you can choose from, uh, and this is just a sample list. Um, I do have that list and a lot of other things available on that website, and I would really appreciate if you check it out to give me any feedback that you have. Uh, so, um, yeah, please please take a look and let me know if you try this stuff out and how it goes. Um, yeah, and this is important, I think, uh, kind of summarized by this quote. Um, Great designs come from great designers, and that's uh, really scary because we're not doing a very good job right now of educating our designers. Um, so what I'd really love to see is for us to work together, okay, to try and become better at design so that we can grow the next generation of architects. Uh, so that's kind of my charge to you guys. Um, hope I've given you some ideas today to put in your silver toolbox, and uh, thank you very much for your time today.
timing. So we have about eight or nine minutes for questions. So time to get stoked. Good Lord. You know, I've, I've got like the adrenaline high thing going right now. It's hard to answer a hard question. Um, <laughs> uh, activities for testing. Um, well, one of the things that I was, I'm probably not going to answer your question, but I'm going to ramble like I might. Um, so one of the things that I was thinking of during um, George's talk anyway is that you can't just kind of do architecture. You know, you have to kind of, I guess, be architecture. Like it's a thing that there's no like one point where you do it. It's a thing that kind of permeates throughout. Um, so like for testing in general, um, you could start with a, maybe start with a make kind of mode. Like why don't you write your tests first, right? And now you've got kind of a TDD mentality. Uh, and then you, from there, might, I have no idea, move to some other, uh, some other ways of thinking and see where that ends up. Um, yeah, nice, nice low ball. Should have planted a better, uh, better start. Um, with a, Okay, so how to control kind of an unruly uh, bunch of architects who just want to argue about tech, for example. Um, yeah, so the ground rules are probably one of the most important things that you can do to start that off. So just straight up set the expectation that that kind of behavior is not acceptable. Um, sometimes you have to let those things play out a little bit, but it comes down to uh, strong facilitation uh, and really um, trying to create an environment where uh, people naturally kind of want to do the right thing. Uh, so I've never actually seen that happen where people are, um, you know, devolving to arguments or things like that, or at least not con in a constructive way, right? Um, and I think a lot of that comes down to setting expectations up front of how we're going to do things and, and why. Uh, and then when those things do come up, uh, trying to embrace it and roll with it and make sure that it stays positive. Um, <laughs> yeah, we can talk about that later too. Um, oh, parking lots. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, yeah, so Ari works in my office, and we have this facility called a parking lot in the middle of meetings. And I thought she just parking lotted me. So, <laughs> um, parking lots is another thing. Yeah. So, hey guys, that's a really great um, discussion that you're having. Let's write this down in this other list, uh, the parking lots, and we'll come back and revisit that later with any anyone who um, might also want to talk about that. So it's a way to keep the meeting focused on what you want without derailing uh, for um, you know, the, the objective that you have as, a, as the architect. So, yeah. Good. Can you give an, an example, typical well, practical? Okay, so you've got this wonderful plan that you've laid out, and then just everything falls apart, right? Um, yeah, that totally happens. Uh, this is one of the things where uh, I guess it's probably my, my biggest fear about kind of talking about some of these things, right? So it seems to work when I'm in the room, right? Uh, but maybe I've just got some experience to be able to adapt and kind of roll, you know, roll with the flow, um, which is why I'm interested in getting these ideas out so that other people can apply them. Um, probably the biggest thing is having a, a robust toolkit, right? So um, not just having one or two practices that you can bring to bear, but having a kind of a wealth of those things uh, and then um, being able, I guess, to pivot, right? So recognizing that, um, you know, I thought we were going to be uh, trying to understand, but it looks like we're dipping into, um, you know, trying to explore. Um, maybe it takes a little bit of experience to, to determine the value, right? Should I try and get the group back on on the track that I had, or should we let it evolve? 
Um, I think that comes down to experience a little bit, uh, but also having um, you know a robust toolkit so that you have options available. Right? Nobody goes in with just a, a hammer, uh, hopefully. Yeah, and, and it's, you know, this idea of, the, of a framework for thinking or design thinking in general, it's not just the designer or it's not just the architect. It, it has to be kind of a systemic organizational um, um, thing, right? Everybody has to embrace it and it has to be a part of the whole culture. So, one more? people thinking with their hands. So we do a lot of this kind of stuff. Um, I mean, most often we draw, right? Sketching is very powerful, and that is a hand kind of driven activity. Um, <laughs> I've tried playing with Legos. That's fun, and it works uh, pretty well. Um, uh, a lot of it is kind of in our, in our minds, right? So doing things like anthropomorphizing. So we often talk about, oh, I am a you know, component B, and I would like to talk to you know, something else, right? Um, and actually, as I'm doing that, I'm noticing that I'm gesturing, and that's something that we often do as well. So um, I, I wouldn't advocate necessarily, just because I don't want to uh, do these sorts of things, um, things like uh, 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 skits or modern dance, but people are talking about those kinds of ideas of you know, um, play acting out uh, different aspects of an abstract idea. Um, so th those are some interesting possibilities, I guess. Um, yeah. I guess we've got to move on to the next one, but I'll, I'll be around if you guys want to talk uh, some more. Thank you. Okay, thank you.